This is the next to the last talk of the semester that I will tell you about the last talk at the end. This talk is so good that it needs two introductions. So I'll hand it over to Sarah for the second introduction. That was an introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you a much better one over here. So. I was introducing you, that's all. Oh, I see. And you need no introduction. That's right. Sorry. Um, uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, I'm very, very happy to introduce Professor Stephen Beckham, who is uh, teaches in interdisciplinary studies right, um, at New York University. Um, and is his talk today is called Art of the Impossible. Um, uh, Steve is the author of um, a book many of you are probably familiar with, Dream, Reimagining Progressive Politics in the Age of Fantasy. He's also the author of Notes from Underground, Deans and the Politics of Underground Culture. He's also the editor of a collection called The Cultural Resistance Reader. Um, any of you in the group here who have taken communication and culture here, um, 206 or TA for that class, know this book very well and know how useful these introductions are to people like Ram <coughs> um, and others in that book. Um, uh, uh, Steve is also, for, um, I'm particularly happy to bring him here today because we've been talking a lot in this department about what it means to be a scholar activist, how you can do activist work when you're also producing scholarship in the academy. Steve is the kind of quintessential definition of the scholar activist. He is an organizer. He's a longtime <coughs> committed political activist. He um, uh, organized the end of the New York chapter of Reclaim the Streets. Um, he is also the co-founder and co-director of a new center um, called the Center for Arts Activism. Is that right? Artistic mm -hmm. Activism. Um, and so is an incredible resource for us in terms of thinking about how to kind of do political activism while producing scholarship that is also politically active. So, um, so you know, he's a great resource for you. I hope you get to know him in terms of that. I also just want to say that his um, work, his scholarship, and his activism has been particularly important to me and my work, um, both through his own books and writings on politics and media and history, um, but also on his <laughs> many comments <laughs> about my work. Um, <laughs> um, um, when I try to kind of navigate through the messiness of thinking about what it means to be political, what it means to be an individual, what culture and art mean um, for us in this particular era that we're in of neoliberal capitalism. Um, um, and uh, he's really pushed me to, you know, not to take to, you know, crib from your own subtitle of your book to reimagine what politics are, what they can be, um, and I think that's what he's going to be talking about even more today. He's currently working on two new projects. One of them is um, about the art of propaganda in the New Deal era, and the other one is, he wrote it down for me, so I remember. <laughs> An open access, open source, multi-platform, digitized version of Thomas More's Utopia, <laughs> called The Open Utopia, and he'll be talking about that today. So please welcome Steve Dutton. Thank you so much for having me here, even if you seem to have greeted me with New York City weather. Um, <laughs> in fact, the irony is that when I left, it started to swarm New York uh, but seriously, I, I, I'm thrilled to be here. I've been here before. I always love talking with students here as well, and the faculty as well. Um, as Sarah pointed out, this is actually a project which comes from a couple of places, and, is, is, and it's going to end as an introduction to Thomas More's Utopia. Um, but it came out of one of the things that I noticed, both as a scholar and as an activist, um, happening over the past five or ten years. And what it was was that a lot of artists, or activists, and I can't quite tell the difference with these folks, um, were imagining unreal and possible futures. So what I want to do is kind of look at some of these and kind of figure out what actually is going on here, okay? Um, I want to start with a preface, um, as we'll explain the title here, which is uh, Otto von Bismarck. Okay, Otto von Bismarck, Germany's Iron Chancellor in 1861, wrote that politics is the art of the possible. 
Okay? And Bismarck was articulating the core philosophy of that hard-headed, hard-hearted real politics that he was famous for, which is this sober understanding of what is possible based in the rational understanding of the present circumstances. Um, uh, in, our, in our time, so Henry Kissinger is probably the, the great practitioner of real politics. But what I want to discuss today is an approach which is currently being practiced by artists, actors, and media makers. We're looking to recapture the transformational promise of their craft, which is an approach to politics, which is perhaps better suited to the real conditions of today, but understanding the real conditions today also include a heavy dose of fantasy, of mediation, and image, narrative, and so on and so forth. In other words, what I want to point out, what I want to suggest here is a sort of a dream politic whose core philosophy might be described as the following. It is that the politics is actually the art of the impossible. On November 12th of 2008, New Yorkers awoke to a special edition of the paper of Early this morning, commuters nationwide were delighted to find out that while they were sleeping, the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan had come to an end. According to the newspaper's publishers, 1.2 million papers were printed in six different presses. They were driven to a number of pre-arranged pickup locations, where thousands of volunteers stood ready to pass them out on the street. Articles in the paper announced the establishment of national health care, the abolition of corporate lobbying, a maximum wage for CEOs, and of course, the end of the world. The paper includes international, national, New York, and business sections, as well as editorials, advertisements, and even a page of corrections. Uh, I don't know, it's like a dream, you know, you, you, you talk about it, everybody's talking about it, it's like, this war needs to end, and here the war is over. It's like, oh my God, I can't believe it. And I knew change was coming to America, I just didn't expect it so fast. <laughs> this is a, a, a deep, positive, potential thing happening here. So I'll take the credit for that, and I think the time should do. I don't understand what state of the by the way. We've been all over the post administration since day one. We set the standards for coverage of the Iraq War. Or that it's atrophied, or something, a civic muscle, a, 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 a thrifty muscle, um, a generous muscle. <laughs> the war is over. Wow, unbelievable. This is Ben Kitzer, reporting from New York City. <laughs> um, the New York Times Special Edition, as it was called, was a project facilitated by two artist activists, Steve Lambert um, of the Anti Advertising Agency and Andy Bickelbaum of the Yes Men. And it included the contributions of literally hundreds of people and a presentation of about as many, and passing out not 1.2 million, but 80,000 copies, still in press and on the left, on the streets of New York. Um, the edition of the Times was not a record of what it was. The New York Times, of course, built itself as the paper of record, but instead an active imagination of what could be. Um, as one person in the third says, it's like the dream. Or it's a the woman. The woman at the end says, what if? Now, I should let you know, if you haven't figured out, that all that was staged. Um, this happened two days before it was ever kicked out. You know, might have noticed that there's a pretty famous TV star in there, and even the great New York Times reporter of the day. Um, they're all actors and friends and what have you, okay? Um, the product was a tangible product. The paper was a tangible product of an imaginary future, as imaginary as the people that were As the altered motto in the upper left corner reads up here, which you may be able to probably not be able to see, but it says, all the news we hope to print, okay? Instead of all the news, this is In other words, it was a utopian media practice. Now, it wasn't a solitary instance. But it was a part of a string of utopian and dystopian expressions that sit someplace on the line between art and politics. I'm just going to go through a couple of these. Um, this works. 
a melting planet. A concerned leader. A ticket clock. In a world on the brink. <laughs> Some said that he was being trusted. The whole They're assuming the mantle of a government in an age ruled by fear. We're talking about what? I think we are based on conspiracy theories. How many planets do we have? All American heroes have essentially a recreation of the WPA from the New Deal era, um, including uh, working with communities, talking to them about what they want done, and raising money on Kickstarter, um, and actually um, having work done, such as uh, uh, regional gardens, creating benches, and so on and so forth. Pushing this a little bit further is a hypothetical development organization. This one's based out of New Orleans. Jones, who creates a series of beautiful, beautifully haunting images of London's 
20 years in the future uh, with climate change. This is London under six meters of water, and this is Buckingham Palace surrounded by candy towns. Um, and one that just recently happened, the sort of utopian, dystopian moment, um, which you may have seen, is uh, Chevron campaign. Um, but this isn't really Chevron's campaign. Chevron had a campaign um, which was about, you know, we agree campaign. Well, the Yes Men and Rainforest Action Network and Amazon launched immediately before it was launched, spoofed it. Um, and instead, we <coughs> prefigured the type of corporation which Chevron is claiming to be, what we'd like them to actually be, which is it's actually about companies which should clean up their mess and are going to clean up their mess. Okay, all these utopian examples got me thinking, okay? Um, it got me thinking of, uh, uh, about a series of questions. One is, why now? Okay? As Francis Fukuyama would have over at the end of this, the triumph of new neoliberalism, the death of all alternatives. What reason is there to imagine an alternative in that world? Two, why a departure from the classical critical revealing function of political art? Okay? <coughs> that is, it, it's the classic function of political art is about revealing the horrors that were or critically commenting upon what is, not necessarily prefiguring a future that might be. Third question is, do utopian and dystopian expressions function politically in a similar manner? Um, kind of, but a big no. Okay? <laughs> um, and finally, what is the politics of utopian expression? Because we don't have time to do any of this, uh, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Okay? Which is trying to figure out what are the potentialities of the politics of utopian expressions like this. Okay. It is totally work or how might they work politically. Because these are people that aren't just artists living in a gallery, they're exceptions you have to do for example. But these are people who think of themselves as activists. Um, and so I think it's fair to say, well, what's going on? How is it working? Not necessarily in an empirical sense, insofar as we can ask the person on the street, although it would be a great thing to actually follow up on it. Wants to do it. Um, but to try to philosophically figure out how these are functioning. And the way to do that, I think, is to go back to that um, about 500 years. Um, to 15, 15, 15, 15. When in doubt, just go to history. That's what I say. So you can go to Marx and then just go to history. Okay? But in any case, um, 15, 15, 15, 16, when Thomas More wrote his Utopia, which, who's read Utopia here? Okay, well, it'll be free and online. And I hope all of you. Um, it's a story of a far-off land which operated under a radically different logic than that of more 16th century Europe. It is also, of course, the genesis of the term utopia, okay? The term that more <coughs> itself. Um, this is what utopia is about. Uh, everything from no private property to most utopias of all, no lawyers. Um, <laughs> uh, and this is just, uh, just uh, you know, a small list. Um, but it's basically 16th century Europe turned out of, of, on its head or 21st century um, United States, or the 21st century world, in the United States, in the United States as well. Uh, utopia, in a word, is utopic. But more is utopia, <coughs> and those of you that have read this, it's a very curious book, okay? It's full of riddles, contradictions, and paradoxes. The grandest riddle of them all is the one you're probably the most familiar with, which is the title of the utopia itself. <laughs> utopia is a made-up word, composed of the Greek view and focus, which essentially means no place. In addition, the storyteller, okay, that is how this works, is Thomas More, who's a character in the book, meets up with his friend, Peter Giles, who's also a character in the book, but the real actual um, uh, uh, figures in the literary life of Europe at that time. And Peter Giles introduces him to this traveler, Raphael de Medea, the second day. And Hitler tells them the story of this magical fall off land. Well, Hitler <coughs> Raphael's last name, comes from the Greek kuthlos, okay? And kuthlos in Greek actually means purveyor of nonsense or trivial things. And this is something that all of his readership would have known because Plato actually uses kuthlos in this way in all of his dialogues. So here we are being told the story of a place which is named out of existence by a narrator whose name is unreliable. And so begins the big debate for 500 years now about utopia. Is it a satire? That is, an exercise demonstrating the absurdity of such political acts of imagination? Or is it, on the contrary, an earnest effort to suggest and promote such alternatives? 
So gonna, now there's evidence for both sides, okay? Here's the evidence for the satirical interpretation. In addition to the names given the place in the narrative, more the description of the island of Utopia makes him very attractive things that in his real life he'd seen dead set against. Moore in his real life is a lawyer. Moore is a landowner. Moore is a king's counselor and a lord chancellor. Moore studied for the priesthood. And perhaps most importantly, Moore is a man. Okay? And he creates a world in which he basically disempowers himself. Okay? A world in which lawyers are outlawed, there's an elected priesthood in government, a lack of private property, and so on. <coughs> he then places these real political suggestions, okay, these real alternatives, with such absurdities like the fact that utopians use gold and silver chamber pots. Okay? So one can see that perhaps what he does is link these two things and therefore make all politics, all political alternatives to 16th century Euro status quo absurd. And you can imagine the phrase, the, 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 uh, the dialogue going something like this. Well, no private property, communal property? Well, that's just about as absurd as taking crap in an old chamber. And this is just one instance, okay? Throughout the entire book and the ancillary letters, most of you probably have read Utopia if you have just as a book, but it was packaged with all sorts of letters on both sides from his literary friends. And throughout all of it, there's all these erudite puns, which basically suggest that we're supposed to um, read Utopia as a joke. One of the greatest ones is, is a long dialogue about the measurement of a bridge. And Moore wants to get how, how how wide was this bridge? How long did it span? He goes back and forth to Peter Johnson. He says, well, when you see Raphael, you should ask him. Okay? Now, this only works. It's not a great joke, but you know, it's a joke. Um, but it's a, it only works because we know that Raphael doesn't exist. You're never going to be able to fact check this because there's no one to ask. Okay? Um, and so it goes. On the other hand, there's evidence for the sincere interpretation. Raphael, our narrator, is named after the archangel Raphael, who gives sight to the blind. Moore is a devout Christian. He wore a hair shirt early on in his life and studied for the priesthood, who sincerely believed in the community of equals of Christ's disciples. And the utopians in the book, we're told, while retaining their religious tolerance, are attracted to Christianity very much for its communalism. There's also the painstaking details that Moore uses in describing Utopia. The bridge, what the island looked like, and so on and so forth. That is, he wants the reader to actually picture it in their mind. In this interpretation, sincere interpretation, Moore uses the absurd, because there's no denying that taking crap in a chamber, gold and silver chamber pot is absurd. He uses it, perhaps, as a way to have his radical ideas, which might be considered heresy in his time, he also distanced himself from it politically. You can almost imagine him talking to his inquisitors, okay, um, and saying, hey, you know, I know I said this stuff about women priests and so on and so forth, but can you see I was joking? He also wrote about a gold chamber pot, you know, so on and so forth. Okay, so this is the two, this is the orthodox debate, okay, whether it's satirical or whether it's sincere. What I want to argue is that it's neither and it's both, okay? And that that's how we can understand and best understand the politics of the utopias. The genius of Moore's utopia is that it is both satirical and earnest, or satirical and sincere simultaneously. And it's through the combination of the seeming opposite ways of presenting imaginaries that a more fruitful way of thinking about imagination can actually start to take shape. In the presentation of utopia as no place, and its narrator as nonsense, it opens up a space, not in the text, but with the reader of the text, or the spectator of the text, to imagine what an alternative someplace might be, and what a radically different sensibility might be like. That is, Moore imagines an alternative to a 16th century Europe, but then openly proclaims it just to be a work of imagination. It can never be realized. It can't be realized because it's unrealistic. It is, after all, as he says in the title, no place. But the readers get infected. That is, once you're exposed to something different, a different way of ordering society, you can't safely return to the assurances of the naturalness of your own world. Okay? You have to make a decision to a certain extent to say, I don't agree with this, but I do agree with the world in which I live in. 
okay? That is, you've been infected. There's an old World War I song that says, how do you keep, you going to keep them on the farm once they've seen gay Paris? And it was all about the farmers that would go off and see Paris, and once you see Paris, you never be happy being back in you know, the Midwest someplace, okay? Kind of like Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> Because once an alternative has been imagined, to stay where one is or to try something else becomes a question. It's not natural. It becomes a question that demands attention and a choice. But, this is the really important but, there's not a short-circuiting of this imaginative moment by presenting a ready-made, believable future. Okay? There's no moment of actually existing socialism, Stalin famously proclaimed. That is, by throwing up an alternative, you're not allowed to say, well, I'm going to give up here. I'm going to leave the Midwest for Los Angeles, okay? Because basically what happens, he said, well, Los Angeles doesn't exist, which it kind of doesn't. Um, <laughs> and that actually kind of throws you back into this place between what you know and what you've imagined. It creates a creative space in which you imagine a different future. There's no simple swapping of one truth for another. Again, you don't get no place. And there's no place that denies the easy option of such a simple choice. To use the phrase of Frederick Jameson in describing utopia, it's a peculiar suspension of the political. But I would also argue that this impossible utopia leaves a space for the return of the political through the response of the reader or the spectator. That is, utopia is not a prank, it's a prompt. Okay? It's a prompt for thinking about something different. The question of alternatives is left open, and the space is open for the reader to imagine, why not? How come? Or as the women interviewed in the New York Times video put it, what if? I was actually drawn into working on the New York Times. I did some of the advertisements, so full disclosure, by one of the main organizers of the prank, um, Steve Lambert. Um, a few months earlier, Steve and a collaborator, Packard Jennings, had asked me to write a catalog essay for a spread of street posters, which were commissioned and displayed by the city of San Francisco on Market Street. Okay? Um, what the artists did is that they were asked to put together a poster on the future of the San Francisco. And so they dutifully asked city planners and architects and so on and so forth about what they thought about the future of San Francisco. And then, in their own words, they perhaps mildly exaggerated the responses. Here's the Muni of tomorrow, okay? Uh, you know, the, the loop de loop, or you get to ride on the elephant. Um, the Z-Line, fastest way across the bay. <laughs> Candlestick farms turned into organic farms. Uh, with linebackers turned into plows. Movable city. Um, you know, we get stuck in these ugly buildings. Um, what this is about, you have public feed sites every you know, four years or so, and you decide to move buildings or blow them up if you don't like them. Um, but this is actually my favorite, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, turning San Francisco into a lot of life the future. Okay. Um, what's so inspiring and honest about the visions of our future offered up by Jennings and Lambert is their transparent impossibility. A city can become more green <coughs> with additional public parks and community gardens, but transforming San Francisco into a nature preserve where office workers sit down and have lunch with the gorilla family, um, it's not going to happen. <laughs> and that's the point, okay? That is, because it's not going to happen, the fantasy fools no one. There's no duplicity, no selling of people a false sense of goods. Okay? Um, there's no claim for actually existing socialism, that you are living in the future now, like it or not. It's an active, an active imagination that people are aware is just an active imagination. Yet, at the same time, these impossible dreams open up spaces to imagine new possibilities. The problem with asking professionals to think outside the box is they won't. That is, they and <coughs> us are constrained by the tyranny of the possible. It's almost impossible <coughs> to let go of gravity, let go of the laws of physics. By visualizing impossibilities, and by setting that as the goal, Lambert and Jennings created an opening to ask what if without ever closing down this free space by seriously answering this is what. Uh, I want to use one, that's okay. <laughs> um, here's their solution for what to do in the bar. Okay? Um, you know, it's really boring uh, you know, on the subways. Um, well, why not actually turn it into a green market? Or better yet, a bar. Or a dog walk. 
or a lending library or a Taekwondo studio. Okay? All of these things are silly. Okay? And then standing in front of one of these posters on a street corner, you can probably smile at the absurd idea of practicing Taekwondo on your train ride home. Sort of like having silver and gold chamber pots. But you may, and this is what the artists are hoping for, practice begin to question why public transportation is so unifunctional. And then ask yourself, why shouldn't public transport system cater to other public desires? And then this could get your mind wondering why the government is so often to this controlling instead of facilitating our desires. And then that might start you to what a truly desirable state might look like. In other words, Jennings and Lambert's impossible solutions, like more utopias, are means to imagine new ones. They are, to quote a phrase of a, a great book that's um, from Picaeus, um, which he ripped off uh, Peter Lambert and Wilson, they are imaginal machines. Okay? They're machines for imagining, the prompts. There's a famous passage in the Bible that those of us invested in political imagination like to cite. It's from Proverbs 29, 18, and it goes like this. Where there is no vision, the people perish. But those of you that know your Bible uh, know that the sentence doesn't end there. Okay? The full sentence goes, that he that keepeth the law happy to speak. Okay? And this is the double-edged sword of political imagination. <coughs> Utopian imagination is necessary. It gives direction, a place to walk toward, yet that imagination will, and to be often translated to the Bible, it must soon pass from imagination to law. This is the utopian history from which we're desperately trying to awake. Communism, fascism, and now neoliberalism. All start out as an idea or an ideal, and each becomes law. And it seems to be an inescapable trap in many ways. But I would argue we've more figured out a way out of that trap. And that is that the vision or the law must be one that can never be fixed or stabilized. This is what Utopia, the book, promises. Imagine alternatives that insist on remaining imaginary, no place. By envisioning the possibilities, Utopia creates that opening, asking what if, without again closing it down and giving a serious answer, this is what. With such visions, the future can never be fixed. There will never be a moment where history is over. Instead, these alternative plans for a future exist and exist only in what the poet Wallace Stevens called our supreme fiction. That is, a fiction that we know is a fiction, but it's useful nonetheless. The utopian visions remind us that there's something just imagine, and thus we can reimagine at will. Utopia, in the end, is no place. And therefore, it prompts the rest of us to find it. And on there. Okay, we have time for questions. What does this have to do with communication? <laughs> <laughs> If you pose these, or you know, these examples slide over into art, where many of them reside, and we are very much, I'd say, still in a context, still in a cultural context in which art is defined as useless. In fact, celebrated as useless. You know, couldn't one argue that this is a way of, of rather than opening up politics, of rather than sliding it over into the you know, sort of expressive, but ultimately, but ultimately useless. useless. Well, I think this is a big question. Again, it would be interesting to do sort of talk to people that actually do this and say, what are you doing? How are you making sense of this? Because I think the danger of this stuff is exactly what I pointed out, which is you smile, you laugh, and it's over. That is, it never goes further than this. It never reaches out from that sort of plane. I guess the counter argument would be is that as more and more, and this goes back to the auto Bismarck is that more and more of our real life and our real existence is based in narrative, is based in stories, is based in images. And in a democracy, necessarily so, insofar as you need the manufacture of consent in order to get anything done. Um, therefore, art, the world of the image, 
the world of the story, um, which I know I'm broadening the definition of art, that's what that in some ways it is, but comes on the sort of front lines. I always think of, you know, the first world guerrilla warfare. Know your terrain and use it to your advantage. Well, the terrain we exist on now is a terrain of signs and symbols and, uh, and stories and narratives. And so this is actually engaging directly in that struggle for hearts and minds. Now, I think what didn't get said here, and what needs to be said is, well, then how do you move it from that place into real world political action, particularly when what you're doing is you're, you're, you're actually creating impossibilities? And how does one actually make a manifestation of impossibility that becomes then useful in the real world? Well, then, I think in some ways, what it, it suggests a couple of things. One is, is that it says, well, this is something that you can use as a prompt in going into sort of political decision making in which the decisions which come out of those bodies actually will create something <coughs> useful. That is, you can't start with the possible or there's nothing to compromise with. Okay? You can't start with what you already know or there's nothing to move forward. So this creates that sort of place outside which creates a discussion by which you come up with reasonable solutions on your way towards that place. That's one thing. The second thing is, is by creating impossibilities, a sort of sense of openness, where everything has to be an open question. If you get away from the utopia and get into this idea of the unfinished nature of utopia, it sets up a sort of a different way of thinking about materiality. The question I always ask my anarchist friends is this. Anarchism is great. How do you create a, hydro how do you create a power grid for a city of 7 million? Okay? Um, and it always, you know, it's just my snobby. <laughs> okay, um, but then I have to ask that question myself. How do you create a utopian power grid? How do you create an open power grid? Well, one of the things you can do is you can say, well, within the given material confines we have, what sort of power systems actually lend itself to that? One of the things we know doesn't lend itself to that is large hydroelectric dams, okay, or large power plants. That's hierarchical top down. Once you've invested that much capital in it, you're not going to recreate it. It's not an open system, it's basically a closed system. Um, but how about a power grid, and most power grids are constructed this way, in which you can sell power into the power grid by a means of different small-scale operations. In other words, um, most power grids actually work this way, which is if I create a wind turbine in my backyard, I can sell power into the power grid and take it back out. Okay? Um, and that creates an openness because I might want to put up a wind turbine, you might want to put up something else, some of it will fail, some of it will succeed. Um, but it creates a different sense of prominence around some big problem, social problem like hydro, or like how do we have a power grid for a long time. Again, I'm kind of thinking this through, but there seems to me, if you, particularly if you move away from utopia <coughs> and say instead what Moore is instructing us is how to have an open system of thinking, that you can bring that into actually solving real political problems and creating and generating real services. Yeah. So, so, and sorry, this is this might be kind of crankier than. Um, be cranky. Um, um, but if that's if that if that is the case, how do we how do we kind of ensure that utopia is about those laws is about a certain kind of progressive politics? In other words, I think that the the notion of the impossible is is crucial yeah. for thinking politically. However, I also think that there are a lot of things happening in neoliberalism which seem really, really impossible. And they're happening and they're normative and I mean just the kind of marketization of of you know arguably every single element of our lives seem seems impossible to me. Right? But it is realized. So how do we how do we direct it? Okay, I think that the you know Probably the one of the most utopian <coughs> systems ever to be built is Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, in the back of my mind, in general, the utopia, that's everything that's going on. Okay? It's also <coughs> one of the most artistically aestheticized political systems ever produced as well. Um, I think that the, the secret is, is exactly in how you put it, which is these things seem impossible, but then they become normative. In other words, they become possible. Utopians have always claimed, whether it was Stalin or whether it was Hitler or whether it was, you know, uh, any sort of new level theorist, that this isn't impossible. That these are possible, <coughs> these far off ideas and say, but this can happen. 
Third Reich can actually is in existence. It is actually existing socialism. These are the laws of market which correspond to the laws of nature. They're always making those truth claims which say this is in existence. The beauty of Thomas More's utopia, when I went back to it, is realizing that he's constantly destabilizing us. Okay? He's building in a critical function into utopia where you always have to ask the question, which is, do I want this? What if? Could we have something else? Now, the direction things can go don't necessarily move in a progressive direction, yet they're built into it. If you accept the idea of impossibility as part of it, it's built in that it's constantly a self-critical uh, 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 process. Okay? Self-criticism very well might lead to a state that we don't want anything to do with, but that might be democracy. So, listen, so listening to you, I'm, I'm finding myself wanting to splice a couple of versions of the utopian imagination together. And I'm wanting to splice Thomas More and Edward Bellamy. Ah, good, good. Because if you took Edward Bellamy, who this notion of the technologist or engineer as king as opposed to philosopher as king, the problem is that it becomes so pragmatic yes. and it erases the human element, the emotional element. Yeah. But if we take more, then what you're telling us is it doesn't become pragmatic enough to achieve action or to achieve the capacity to move. And what I've always thought of as critical utopianism has to have both of those moves, recognizing what, what, what would be a set of ideals, what we're building toward, recognizing what the gap to the current state is, and then figuring out how you bridge the two or bridge in the right direction. And I'm wondering, is there a way to couple the more pragmatic side of someone like Bellamy in with your, your vision of utopianism? What would that add? Or, would that totally corrupt what you see as useful? No, I don't think it corrupts what's useful. I think what you need is you need a place for dreamers, you need a place for the possibilities, and you also need a place for engineers. Um, and you need to get them in the same room. Um, and then I don't think that these people are engineers. Um, there was a great, was that Charsky? One of the uh, you know, uh, early Soviet arts commissioners you know, said, these guys play the engineers, the constructivists. They have no idea how to actually build anything. And as Susan Bakamar said, well, that's the point. Okay, that is, they didn't know how to build things. But if you enter into a conversation with engineers, you've at least given them an idea of a possibility that might be outside the realm of their possibility. But I think that is important. That this is not, again, something which can stand upon itself. This is a provocation. And what these artists and activists would claim is that the problem at this moment in history is actually, this is something we didn't talk about here, is that. Criticism by itself is no longer useful, or no longer actually has critical function. And what seems to be the critical problem are actually wants is the atrophy of imagination. And so what they're in is sort of soldiers on the management of front, trusting that we have this sort of infrastructure of sobriety um, of the engineering culture to actually not build this, but actually build something else. To go back to, I think, the this is really sort of circling on some of the same things. So if you take John Stewart's rally on yeah. the mall, is that an example of what you're talking about? Because it could right. easily be seen as the evacuation yeah. of politics well, in the guise of the... Yeah. Well, that, uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I'm sure like half the people in the room here, I mean, to, you can ask to ask me a comment on that by someone or another in the media. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, I do agree that it. And I, I thought, you know, as it was launched, it became an impossible rally. Okay, that is, a rally which was based upon, you know, essentially a, a phantasm, a phantasmagoric, you know, idea of political actors and so on and so forth. But then it became very serious. And so as it actually happened, John Stewart makes his transition, where at the end he's making sort of serious truth claims about the politicians. Now the question is, did that rescue it from becoming an ironic winking inside? Or did that actually ruin its transforma transformational capabilities? I don't know. Um, I, I worry about this sometimes. You know, the, the John Stewart stuff particularly worries me, which is that notion where it all becomes just consumables and um, where this just becomes, as you know, this goes back to your first question, right? Is that does this just become, oh, isn't this funny? Isn't this clever? Um, and again, there's something about the absurdity of it which I think might rescue that moment. I mean, the difference between this and the West Wing, for example, the West Wing became sort of a liberal cabinet in, uh, in exile during the Bush Reagan years, okay? And I always had problems with that because it basically became this place in which progressives could have the politics they always wanted. Actually, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Actually, 
remember, West Wing started in the Clinton, and it was the wet dream of what, <laughs> what, of what the Clinton should have been, but wasn't. It was the one that took you backstage and showed you why he couldn't be what you wanted because of all those pressures. So it was the, it was the, the cover up, but it was during Clinton. They, had a, they got, it got awkward once they got to Bush because it didn't. It didn't, oh, that's right. It didn't fit anymore. Right. One, other, one other point about this. The yes men seem to me to be a different category from some of these. Because the, the yes men's trick is to go into the go into the lair of the powerful and fool them. Uh, which is not the same as handing out things on the street or giving them to people. It's playing a somewhat different. Well, the, well they do they do both things. One of the things they do is they actually amplify the absurd logic of corporate rationality. Okay, they do that well. The other thing they've done, which is that they do the Chevron campaign and one of their first campaigns, which is the Union Carbide campaign, was they put, which I actually think are the most interesting campaigns, is they put forth this idea or an ideal of what corporations should be. And then the corporations have to backpedal and say, why aren't we actually doing that? So, um, it's, so it's more of a utopian moment <clears throat> in a larger strategy. Well, except it forces. It, it forces that response. I mean, yeah. you know, your, your New York Times reporter here was fake. Yes. I mean, we don't actually have a New York Times response. To well, it. the response was, uh, we're looking into that. <laughs> 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 and the New York Times response also was, um, after they, you know, figured out how to spin it, we're flattered. <laughs> because of course, we are the big <laughs> Like it's this kind of artwork is like um, an expression of hopelessness in a way, and um, I don't know that it it um, empowers people to change society or um, you know make it a better place and you know overcome tyranny in the state or any of that or environmental issues. But I I think we're at a, like a much like lower scale to the point where like it's just um, it's just making a suggestion that there's a community of people that want change you know and I think that's where the power lies in that I don't I don't I don't really think most of the people that read this it's like pearls before swine they don't even care they don't even know or look at it but I think the people that do read it feel like especially like younger people that there may be other people with their like mind and it seems like for that alone like it's a sort of activism it's not an activism in like your political sense but it's sort of like a community acknowledgement and to chew on another then and i actually think you're on to something there um, therefore, would the content not matter? In other words, do this. would a uh, graffiti stencil saying stop the war serve the same function? It, it wouldn't matter because it's not for sale. That's why it doesn't matter. And, and because it is this No money. one's selling you right. anything, and you don't have to pay. Yeah. Well, there's interesting, one of the groups that helped us out with this was Improv Everywhere. And Improv Everywhere does not do political stuff. And I talked to the founder, I said, why don't you do political stuff? He said, because we're, we're interested in the politics of wonderment. And actually, if it was tied to a political project, just like they've been asked by many corporations, as you can imagine, to do some things, <laughs> that it would ruin the moment of wonder, which is the not for sale, that there must be a sense of not for sale. One of the groups that I've talked to in Spain, um, who comes out of a long political uh, practice, very sort of traditional political organization practice, uh, much like my own, is very interested in this sort of politics of non instrumental wonderment. He basically says, look, anytime we create something, he is from this group, Yomanga, who does these sort of spectacular, you know, fantastic political type stuff, um, activism. He's like, but anytime we actually then immediately get down to sort of Larry's question, which is, well, what do we do with this? How do we get it to be practical? We lose that moment. We lose the moment that needs to be opened up to imagine what could be different than the tyranny of the possible, okay? Or, you know, the adornal to a teeth gritting harmony. Yeah, that just sort of, you know, it's horrible, we know it's horrible, but we can't imagine anything else. In those moments, I think these artists, and people are interested in saying artists, because most of these folks would not necessarily consider themselves artists, they would consider practice so much. Want to create that space to see what happens. 
But what happens in that space can be very scary, okay? But they're seeing that that space has to be opened up in order for us to imagine something outside of the usual, but we must do this, we must do that. Now, for political organizers, it's a very hard place to be. You immediately want to instrumentalize. You immediately want to take this stuff and do something with it. And if you look on page two of the New York Times, it's all, if you're inspired by this, here are the groups that you should do X, Y, and Z. Um, I actually think that loses some of the magic of this, okay? But the magic of this is there is nothing to do. Sit with it. Now what do you want to do yourself? Okay? We're not going to tell you what to do because you can't do this. And I would say in some ways, and I talk about this in my introduction, this fails. There's no surplus imagination in this. What this has is it tells you the world that we'd like to do. It's very effective for that moment, but there's no surplus imagination. You either buy into it or you don't. And when I was handing it out, I saw people, depending on their political proclivities, they would shake their heads and smile, or they just toss it in the garbage. Uh, it didn't create that, I don't know what to do with this politics moment that the crazy San Francisco posters do, um, or the flooded cities do, or the, the you know, the thumbs up, uh, you know, the politics of that? I have no idea. So where do you put the onion, which is certainly very close the, to this? The onion is just classic satire. Um, and actually, it was interesting, when, when this came out, there was, a, there was a, a, an editor got fired from it. Um, and the editor got fired partly because she tried to move it into satire. And the um, editor the, from? From uh, the, the New York, this special edition of the New York Times. And the organizer said, look, it's not about satire. We want it to be absurdly sincere. Um, because the, 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 the Onion, sort of like uh, John Stewart, is very easily consumable as the laugh and the wind which allows the system to go on. There's something very earnest about this, yet also crazy about this. Well, it's earnest, yeah, I get that, but, it, but the complexity of the, of the job, yeah. you know, of the thing, cross, I think yeah. crosses over here. Well, the, the complexity of the job, and also, I mean, one of the things that was very powerful about is the veracity of this. Yeah, and right. that in Moore's Utopia, that's one of the things that works, is he has long descriptions of exactly what the island looks like. And this thing looks and feels exactly like the New York Times. So how much did the people, I'll tell you why I'm asking yeah. you, how much did the people do this hope that it would get picked up as a news story somewhere? Put, pick, picked up straight. Because my recollection of college newspaper, yeah. you know, April Fool's issues, <laughs> right. was always, that success meant when the local news media would pick up their, as as their fake story and report it. Right. Well, this one, they debunked as they produced it. Um, and the Yes Men are actually very good at debunking as they produce it. When they, with their, their, their Chevron one, they actually got picked up in ad age and as the real, as the real thing. But what they do is they debunk their own work. For example, the, the, when they did the BP, people know about the BP? Okay, um, Andy Bicklebaum appeared on uh, BBC in front of an audience of millions at the 10th anniversary of the Bhopal disaster and said the Dow Chemical was uh, taking full responsibility. Uh, and <laughs> they were going to take all the profits they had made that year and divide them up and so on and so forth. Well, BP, of course, very smartly, did nothing. And so what did the Yes Men do? The next day, they issued a denouncement of the action from BP <laughs> saying we would never take responsibility <laughs> for our things. And then so basically, you know, you just, you just and then play off that sort of thing. Um, so I, I think in this, what they consciously did, I mean, there's, there's different places where there's cues that you can't take this seriously, just like Thomas More's Utopia has cues that say you can't take this seriously, but on the other hand, it looks, it feels, it has that sort of affect of response of, wait a second, this is something real. Could be possible. It's a chart to line between possibility and impossibility. I'm going to call this a question. On, um, what's your sense on like, the US RDA? Um, how much of, of this kind of thing should be consumed on a regular basis? I, I, I just wonder whether scale isn't part of the at the, at the at the at the heart of the health question here, with Stuart being something that you can have every yeah. night and, right. and do again and again. And some of these others being conscious provoking in a way that they're beyond the norm and therefore have to be, to a certain extent, rare. That's actually a great question, which is what would happen if everything becomes absurd? Um, the Yes Men now have a training institute called the Yes Lab. And the question has been, well, what happens if everybody pranks everything, okay? What is there left to prank? Um, you know, it only works insofar as you're in a, I would say, almost parasitical relationship to the straight man. And straight man being straight society. 
again, this is why I'm much more interested less in the New York Times prank and much more interested in sort of those last series of posters you've seen and the development association. People that are moving past this sort of prank um, and moving towards these sort of phantasmagorical. I think there's an immense audience for the, fan for the for phantasmagorical thinking at this moment. Um, partly because, as you know, Sarah pointed out, neoliberalism is phantasmagorical. Um, and so it's just competing fantasies to a certain extent. Um, and saying, look, our fantasies are even more attractive, but we're willing to tell you that they're fantasies. Um, and therefore, it's up to you to figure out what you want to do. I had a thought when you know when we're talking about the practicality of this, or what the kind of the kind of practical, tangible outcomes would be that one would desire to see, or that one would be interested in seeing. And I hope this doesn't sound too flippant a suggestion. But I'm thinking of like the 826 Valencia projects, where Dave Eggers and his group of folks create these false storefronts that are either like the Brooklyn superhero supply store, or here we have the Echo Park time travel mart, right? um, and there. Phantasmagorical, I think, in the sense that you described. They're real places, they're commercial places, they blend into their, their streets or whatever. What their project is, is to kind of seduce children into participating in an after school environment where they are learning to read and write and, and doing all of this. And then the practical kind of payoff for that is that the, the, the surplus imagination that you talked about, where the fact of a superhero supply store produces in these kids a surplus imagination that produces writing that is then published, and the proceeds from that go back into the schools, et cetera. And I wonder if that's kind of that's one of those idea. interstitial places where it doesn't advocate necessarily politics, right. but it does produce a kind of stopgap measure right. where it's solving a problem that maybe isn't being solved appropriately elsewhere, but using the same tactics okay. that you're describing. Part of me loves it, and part of me is really creeped out by it. Because in some ways, what that's like is it's like you know advertising saying, you know, come in. If you use the hair product, you'll get laid. You know, and then you just get hair. <laughs> and it's like, hey, you too can be a superhero. Now here's how to do a sentence. It's got a subject. It's got a predicate. It's got an object. And so you know, I kind of love the idea, but it seems to me that that's using the fanta fantasy as a hook into reality, mm -hmm. sure. and I think I'm much more interested in using the fantasy as a way to escape the real into a place where one can imagine what might be different. Uh, but I, I hadn't thought about the connection, which is really kind of cool. Um, hold on, let me just write something okay. down here. Yeah. I'm interested in your thoughts of um, the art of the impossible in on, on, online settings, because mm -hmm. it seems like it really gives people the ability to do a lot of this. One of the things that comes to mind is early on when uh, Foursquare came out, location-based services, you can check into different places. So a lot of people had a lot of fun with doing things like checking in uh, to a restaurant in London, and an hour later they checked into a restaurant in San Francisco. <laughs> right. I think somebody checked into a location on the moon, actually. Right. So you know, I'm just your thoughts on that. Does it make it easier for well, more people to participate? I actually think what's kind of neat about that is, that is actually, again, just like kids are attracted to being a superhero and therefore they can suffer in reading or buying in a food case. Um, what this is, is sort of, there's a lot of nascent um, fantasy in all of us. And given the technology, um, we'll do weird things with it. Why not imagine what it'd be like to be bodyless, okay? To actually float around. Um, now, is it political in the grand sense of does it lower air fares? Does it make uh, air travel uh, you know, carbon free or anything? No, it doesn't. Um, but it does perhaps make people imagine themselves as not national. They're not as national. Okay? Again, I'm just speaking off the top of my head here. But I think what your example says is that like, we want to fantasize. We want to not be bound by the laws of physics. We don't know how. But the ways that we do know how are circumscribed by the market. And this is the sort of places in which to do this that lie outside the market. And I think actually online you know, worlds are exactly a place, whether it be role playing mm -hmm. um, or whether it be kind of moving around. <laughs> well, um, this somewhat, my, in response to Nina, my kind of, the reason why I'm creeped out by 826 Valencia is because it kind of seems 
like what's being peddled is not the fantasy of being a superhero, but it's the fantasy of being an adult who gets to live in a world surrounded by superheroes, and the kind of adult who gets to think about literary fiction and sell fake time travel things and inspire children. And that is possible, perhaps, if you inherit a fortune from your parents who died suddenly, as Dave Eggers did. Um, and so I guess that kind of comes to this. It, yeah, well, I think that came after, but about the parents dying, I guess, was the best-selling book. But um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so what is, I guess it's whose fantasy gets to be spectacularized and whose fantasy gets to be so well realized that it gets to be meaningful? Well, again, look, I mean, they seem, certain people are going to be able to articulate their fantasies better. These the people that put this together are obviously, including some of their time players, um, obviously well trained professionals. Okay? Um, but I guess what I'm saying is that Moore has built something in that basically denies the ability to inhabit that world. Most fantasy, Disneyland, or we just a Lego man a couple of days ago, is about living within a fantasy which is completely created for us. Whether that fantasy be, you know, <coughs> really forced collectivization is a great thing, or it's Lego land, okay? But what Moore does is continually deny your ability to live within that world, and it forces you out to imagine another world. Okay? How then you articulate it is not a problem to deal with. Okay? And that may be a problem that needs to be dealt with. But it's what I like about this world is exactly that, is it doesn't allow you to inhabit someone else's fantasy. Because utopianism, I think, has been marred by exactly that, which is here is the world you should inhabit. Now go live in. And the human beings are not seen as shapers, they're seen as shaped. <coughs> People that exist within the architecture. Follow the algorithms which are already programmed. Well, <coughs> next week's speaker, there's a connection here. Um, 